Hey everyone, Pastor Caleb here with another Lenten devotion. Uh, we're reading through the book of Luke, Luke for Lent, and I hope you're doing that with us. If you have not started with us, you should download the reading program uh, from the description of the video on YouTube or the episode notes on the podcast and join us. Even if you haven't been reading with us through Lent, you could pick up right here at chapter six, um, where the idea for these devotions is that I'm going to give you some comments on the text that you read yesterday so that you spend the time reading it and meditating on it, praying through it and uh, doing your best to understand it. And then I'm going to help you with hopefully some devotional thoughts to sort of round out your, your study and also help you learn how to read the Bible. I, my job is not to read the Bible for you, but to help you learn how to read the scriptures. So the text that we're looking at today is Luke 6 verses 1 to 16. That's the text you read yesterday. So I'll paraphrase it for you and then give you a couple uh, devotional thoughts. Jesus is out on the Sabbath day uh, walking past some grain fields with his disciples and his disciples start to pick some of the grain and uh, eat some of the grain kernels. This was totally acceptable. This was actually part of the Old Testament law. But the Pharisees did not like this because they were doing this on the Sabbath day. Uh, For them, the Sabbath day was a day where you were supposed to do absolutely no work based on a set of rules that they had made that they called um, the hedge. They have a Hebrew name for it, but that's what it meant in English. And the idea was uh, that it was like a buffer zone of laws that would keep you away from breaking the actual laws, but those buffer laws that they they turned into um, the laws themselves. Um, So we'll explain a little bit about that in in the devotional points, but that's the idea here. Uh, Jesus then tells this story about David in the Old Testament. And he says that uh, David was on the run. And when he was on the run and his, he and his companions were hungry, they went to the consecrated bread in the tabernacle and said, can we eat this? And um, the, this, the uh, priest did not stop them. And they did not get in trouble for that, even though that was actually uh, technically against the law that God had put for the consecrated bread, that, that no one was supposed to eat it. Um, And so Jesus' point of this is Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He says, I am the son of man that's talking about himself is Lord of the Sabbath. Um, We'll apply that in the the devotional points as well. Another Sabbath day, so presumably a week from from this moment, he goes into the synagogue and is teaching and a man with a shriveled hand comes. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are watching to see if he's going to heal this man on the Sabbath because they want to catch him doing work on the Sabbath. Um, Jesus plays right into their hands on purpose and says, all right, get up in front of everybody. I'm going to show what's what. And he heals the man, and of course, this uh, infuriates the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. After this, we find out that Jesus went on a mountainside to pray for a whole night, and after which he called his disciples. So that's the text of 6, verse 1 to 16. Um, First devotional thought is on the Sabbath day. So we just kind of need to understand what's happening here. The Sabbath day was the sixth, or excuse me, sixth day, uh, seventh day of the week. Uh, It's the sixth day of our week, but it's the seventh day of their week um, that uh, that it was Saturday. And Saturday was supposed to be the day that they rested because God rested on the seventh day of creation. The thing about this rest um, was that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had put some some laws around this idea of rest on the Sabbath day in order to make it almost impossible to not rest on the Sabbath day. So the idea would be like, um, you know, if, if you're not allowed to drink alcohol, let's say you're underage, you know, you're not allowed to drink alcohol. You make this rule for yourself. I'm not even going to walk into the alcohol aisle at the, you know, or I guess we don't have alcohol aisles so much in Canada, except in some of the grocery stores, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to walk into the alcohol aisle and uh, I'm not, that's going to be my rule. Well, that's not actually the rule that the government has put down about your drinking age. It's just a rule you made for yourself. And it might be helpful in keeping you from being tempted, but it's not a rule that you should hold anybody else to because it's not the law of the land. Uh, This is kind of what the Pharisees did with the Sabbath laws. They said, um, okay, the Bible says we should not work on the Sabbath. So what we're going to say is anything that even smells like work, basically, is going to be against the Sabbath laws. And uh, we're going to hold people accountable to it. And Jesus says, in contrast to this, well, check out David. In the Old Testament, David took the consecrated bread that was not supposed to be eaten, but he ate it. And the reason he ate it was because he was very hungry and in need. And Jesus' point of this is to say the laws that God gives in the Old Testament are not to be followed for the sake of being followed. They are to be followed in order to lead God's people toward holiness. And in the case where it would actually be more loving to keep a person alive by giving him bread rather than going through the ceremony of keeping the consecrated bread from being eaten, it is okay for David to eat the bread. And therefore, Jesus is making this point. The Sabbath is not pointless, which is what I think some people think. They're like, oh, Sabbath, we don't have to do that anymore. We shouldn't do that anymore, in fact. No, the Sabbath has a purpose. The purpose, though, is to draw God's people closer to holiness, not to be followed for the sake of being followed. And the same is true with basically any law in God's uh, system of, of commands. The commands are not there so that we can be right with God or so that we can adhere to a system perfectly, but that knowing that we are saved in Jesus, we have the opportunity to grow in 
holiness and to be more like God in our behavior, to be more godly. And we should apply this more to more than just to the Sabbath day, um, but really to all of our Christian living. Um, Christians do not have to do anything to be saved. That does not mean that Christians don't do anything at all. Christians actually pursue holiness and love of the neighbor um, with a, a great amount of energy and in investment because that is what is good. Um, not because they need to, like some system, but because they have the opportunity to. So as we think about this point, I mean, we could talk about Sabbath. I've already talked about it in these devotions. And if you want to talk about it more, just let me know. But my big thing for us would be to think about how do we pursue holiness, not because those are the rules, but pursue holiness because we love God and we want to love our neighbor. Um, second devotional point, is about Jesus praying. So in, in verse 12, uh, it's just one little one-off statement by Luke here, but it says that Jesus went on a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. Um, I think it's a little bit scary and dangerous to get into the idea of Jesus as example for us because you very quickly can get away from Jesus as savior and the one who has died and rose again for us. But that does not mean that Jesus is not an example. And we should take this really seriously. Um, Jesus praying and how much he prays uh, is an example to us of what it means to be a Christian, to have a relationship with God. And does that mean that we are necessarily commanded here to pray overnight? Um, no, I would say this text is not prescriptive. It is descriptive of something that Jesus did one way he applied prayer prayer in his life. But that same level of commitment should be evident in our life. Um, so what does that look like? Well, I'm sure it means sacrificing something for the sake of prayer. I mean, Jesus is obviously sacrificing sleep. So what are you sacrificing for prayer? And God, God calls us to this, a relationship with God, knowing who God is, knowing what God provides, knowing what God has done for us. We ought to pray and be willing to sacrifice quite a bit in order to pray. Um, is it sleep for you? Maybe you don't have to pray overnight, but maybe it means getting up half an hour early so that you can pray in the morning. Maybe it means not watching a show at night so you can spend time praying. Maybe it means that you're going to skip lunch. You're going to fast so that you can pray on some days. Um, I don't know what it looks like, but uh, prayer and sacrifice of the things of this world are very closely tied. Um, and then my, you know, every time I talk about prayer, I want to talk about the Psalms. So let's remember Jesus prayed the Psalms. Right, what was he doing? He was reciting Psalms. And uh, we ought to do the same thing. Final devotional point then is the disciples here. And I think uh, you, you could go pretty deep on this and figure out all the stories of all these disciples. And maybe you want to do that. You can look up these guys' names and uh, hear kind of where they come from. But one of the things I want you to notice is just the uh, diversity of types of people who were disciples of Jesus. So uh, probably the easiest ones to pick out are guys like Peter and James and John because they show up. They're these um, very boisterous. I mean, James and John are called the sons of thunder. Peter is one who is constantly the first to speak and the loudest to speak. Um, these very boisterous personalities. Then you hear people here of disciples who you barely hear anything of. You could search the names Bartholomew, for example, um, or James son of Altheus, and, and you would have trouble finding things that they did. Um, and, uh, and then you have uh, political enemies, I guess, in the case of Simon the Zealot. He would be like kind of your alt-right. Zealots would, were the, the people who hated the Roman government would actually carry around a um, a, a dagger or something like this. If they had the chance to kill a Roman, they would do it. Um, so he was he was political alt right, and yet he was a follower of Jesus. Um, you have Matthew, the tax collector, who we would be considering. We would consider probably like um, you know closer to the left, in in bed with big power um, and kind of more of a big government kind of person. So you have guys on the left and on the right who are in this group. You also, of course, have Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. Um, the, the amazing thing that Jesus did is called a disciple who would betray him and who would not be saved. And that's really important for us to think about too, that like even Jesus lost some people in his church. I mean, he lost one of his disciples, right? And so as we think about preaching the gospel and, and living like Christ, we have to know that if we are living like Jesus did, we are necessarily going to push some people away and they're going to reject us and reject Jesus. And that's just, just what it means to be um, connected to Jesus in a world that hates him. Uh, so you can go deeper on that if you want. I'm not going to uh, for the sake of our time today. But I appreciate you taking time for this devotion, and I look forward to studying the next text with you tomorrow.